Blessed be the God of our salvation. Who bears our burdens and forgives our sins. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. God of all mercy. We confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your purpose in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen.
God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations. And as you know the weaknesses of each, let each one find you mighty to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> A reading from the book of Deuteronomy the 26th chapter, verses 1 through 11. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it, and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, 
and the most high our habitation. There shall no evil happen to you, neither shall any day come near your body. Ye shall be his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and lion. You shall trample the young lion and the serpent under your feet. Ye shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Because he is bound to me in love, therefore will I deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I am with him in trouble. I will rescue him and bring him to honor. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and generous to all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to
Fiesz faithfulness of the Yeshiel and Butler. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. After his baptism, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I will give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The first of the desert monastics, Saint Anthony, was reported to have taught, quote, this is the great task of man, that he should hold his sin before the face of God and count on temptation until his last breath." End quote. We tend to count upon temptation with our first Lenten breath, for no sooner as those ashes are smeared on our foreheads than we have sworn to some sacrifice of some beloved treat for the entire season thereby inviting temptation in for a 40-day fight. We might be feeling the first pangs of temptation, or <laughs> at least deprivation, on this first Sunday of Lent. This is when we hear the story of Jesus' temptation in the desert. After Jesus emerges from the water of his baptism and hears an affirmation of his identity from his heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit then leads him into the harsh Judean desert where he is tempted by the devil for 40 days, all the while with no provision of food or water. This is the part of the story we likely identify with, 
we who have taken on this discipline throughout Lent. But what is the meaning of all this? Why does Jesus willingly face into temptation during his 40 days in the desert? And why do we reprise this same struggle each Lent? If you're anything like me, the idea of facing temptation is not exactly an appealing uh, prospect. We pray every time we say the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. Temptation seems to be something that makes us feel bad about ourselves. It can take, make us feel vulnerable and helpless. We face enough challenges in our day-to-day -day lives. It can be hard to then willingly give up something or things that bring us respite and joy amidst the chaos. For all who struggle with Lenten discipline, I want to share another way of seeing temptation, one drawn from the monastic tradition. For monastics, monks and nuns, or what we would call today vowed religious, temptation is not something to be avoided. Following Jesus into the desert, monastics choose to go the other way, straight toward temptation. Sometimes this journey is literal. Beginning around the third century common era, men and women began following Jesus' example and migrating into the desert to live an ascetic life. This path was not intended to be an escape from the toil of life and community, but rather an engagement directly with temptation and the dark forces which endeavor to separate us from God's love. We read in St. Athanasius' biography of Anthony, that when he left the city with the specific intention of engaging in spiritual warfare in the desert, he got his wish. Once Anthony was in the desert, the devil tried to lead him away from the ascetic life with reminders of his wealth, his former love of fame and glory, worry about the care of his sister, as well as concern for his own health in the desert terrain, just to name a few of those temptations the devil tried. But Anthony was not swayed. Athanasius continues, quote, but he, like a man filled with rage and grief, turned his thoughts to the threatened fire and the gnawing worm and setting these in array against his adversary, passed through the temptation unscathed. All this was a source of shame to his foe, for he, deeming himself like God, was now mocked by a young man, and he who boasted himself against flesh and blood was being put to flight by a man in the flesh." End quote. By facing into temptation, Anthony bested the devil, just as Jesus did before him. While our struggles in Lent may not be quite as intense as Anthony's, we hope, we go into the desert of abstinence, discipline, and prayer with the same goal that led him all those centuries ago into the wilderness. We do it to face into temptation. But in order for the experience to be effective and not destructive, we have to be thoughtful about the discipline we select and how to pursue it. One of our forebears in this monastic community offers a helpful teaching on this point. Father Arthur Hall, SSJE, later the third bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Vermont, teaches two benchmarks to consider when picking a Lenten discipline. First, he says that it should entail the sacrifice of the lower self for the sake of the higher self. Arbitrarily selecting a Lenten discipline without discernment to its ulterior end is to set about in an adventure in missing the point. 
If we do not have the growth of our higher nature in mind when we set out on our Lenten discipline, then our abstinence risks being in vain. And we will not stand a chance when confronted with temptation. Second, Hall teaches that the purpose of our Lenten discipline is for the training and building up of our spiritual fortitude, not the destruction or its tearing down. Hall's teaching here draws directly on the wisdom of the desert tradition. The desert Ama Theodora says, quote, let us strive to enter by the narrow gate just as the trees stood before the winter storms and cannot bear fruit, so it is with us. This present age is a storm, and it is only through many trials and temptations that we can obtain an inheritance in the kingdom of heaven." End quote. If we select the right Lenten discipline, we, in a sense, select the right temptation, and we will be fortified not broken down by our struggles. Think of training for a marathon. A runner starts out gradually, incrementally building up the body and its endurance. Overtraining and ignoring what the body needs will lead only to injury or quitting, thereby sabotaging the goal before we even take our first stride in the race. To be successful at anything, you have to know your limits and your ultimate goal. The, thing, the same goes for spiritual discipline. A saying attributed to the fourth century desert monastic Evagrius Ponticus instructs, if you want to know God, learn to know yourself first. Any spiritual discipline whether it's a monastic discipline, like the vows, or a Lenten discipline, like reading scripture or giving up beer, is not ultimately about giving something up for Jesus to show your love for him. Rather, it's about identifying what will help you become a better follower of Jesus. What are the obstacles separating you from the love of God. Start small. In the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, we read, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. What we do with our lower nature, however small, can actually transform our higher nature to the glory of God. Perhaps this is what it really means when we read that St. Anthony faced his demons. He confronted the demons of his lower self for the sake of his higher self, that self that was called to follow Jesus. In this way, all the desert mothers and fathers practice what Benedictine writer Anselm Gruen calls spirituality from below. In his book, Heaven Begins Within You, Gruen explains that today's spirituality is often from the top down. Spirituality presents high ideals that we're supposed to somehow translate into physical reality. Along the way, we usually end up repressing our weak points and limits because they clash with our lofty ideals. The desert mothers and fathers, on the other hand, teach spirituality from below. They show us that we have to begin with ourselves and our passions as they really are. The way to God always passes through self-knowledge. And what better way to learn about ourselves than facing through temptation? I wonder if this, in fact, was why the Spirit led Jesus into the desert in the first place. Perhaps Jesus willingly undertook his 40-day fast in order to learn more about who he was, what it meant to be both divine and human. 
St. Gregory of Nazianzus said that what has not been assumed has not been healed. Take heart in your Lenten fight with temptation that Jesus has been there before you. Jesus and all the centuries of monastics who headed into the desert in earnest anticipation of the struggle they would find there. We are not alone in our Lenten pilgrimage. Just as the Spirit led Jesus into the desert, so Jesus joins us on our journey. In fact, he leads us there for our growth and God's glory. This Lent, remember that temptation is not sin. It's not failure. And it's not something to avoid. Rather, temptation is a useful tool in the right ordering of our affections. When you feel temptation during these next 40 days, stop and process what is going on within you. Let the temptation teach you. Let it show you what distracts you from being the person whom God created you to be. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations. And as you know the weaknesses of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
God of mercy in whom we put our trust, we name before you those persons and concerns for which we pray. Hear us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have put our trust in you. Hear us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have put our trust in you. We pray for your church, Purge it of divisions. Grant to your faithful people pardon and peace. Strengthen for service all baptized in your name. Hear us, O Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have put our trust in you. Give to those you draw to baptismal waters and the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Life through your saving death and resurrection. Hear us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have put our trust in you. We pray for the world, its nations and leaders, for peace with justice in the human family that all may share the riches of your bounty. Hear us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have put our trust in you. For all who suffer in body or spirit, those homeless, destitute, exploited, or oppressed. Give them the support of your Spirit's healing. Hear us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have put our trust in you. In union with saints and martyrs in heaven, we pray for those who have departed this life. 
Grant us to share your suffering and your glory. Hear us, O Lord, have mercy upon us. For we have put our trust in you. Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and in all our dangers and necessities, stretch forth your right hand to help and defend us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace we are able to triumph over every evil, and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. 
You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us, and so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. John the Evangelist, and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, Yeah. 
Loving Father, we who are physically distant now, grown inwardly as we await the day when we are restored to the company of our neighbors and brought to the fullness of your presence in the Eucharistic feast. Comfort us in our longing to be near each other. Assure us of your indwelling presence and hasten the day when we will abide with you and all our beloved siblings in that kingdom where there is neither sorrow nor crying, but the fullness of joy with all your saints, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Faithful God, in this holy bread, you increase our faith and hope and love. Lead us in the path of Christ, who is your word of life. We ask this in his name. Amen. Bow down before the Lord. Grant, Almighty God, that your people may recognize their weakness and put their whole trust in your strength, so that they may rejoice forever in the protection of your loving providence, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Welcome to this live streamed Eucharist from the Monastery of the Society of St. John the Evangelist in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We brothers are honored that you have joined us either in real time or in virtual time. A uh, number of announcements today. Um, one of them is that we have the exciting news that we will be receiving the initial, initial profession of our brother Todd uh, on Saturday, Saturday the 12th of March at 11 a.m. That service will be live streamed, and so you'll be able to join us um, over the internet um, by going to our chapel page on our on our on our website. Um, Todd has perhaps had one of uh, um, I don't know 
challenging, unusual novitiates in perhaps the history of the society. Uh, a week before he was clothed, um, we went into lockdown, the chapel was closed, the guest house was closed, and here we are two years later, um, we're still closed. Um, and so, as I say, Todd came for one thing, and he's got quite a different experience. Um, it must be that, um, that he has a real vocation if he's been able to survive this two years. Um, anyway, we are thrilled that he will be uh, making his initial profession on Saturday at 11 o'clock. Um, and speaking of closing, um, we anticipate being able to reopen the chapel next Sunday, Sunday the 13th of March, uh, for the 9 o'clock Eucharist. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of um, preconditions to that, however. Um, we will be requiring people to pre-register for that, and an email will be going out to our e-list, our congregational e-list about that later in the week. And we will need you to pre-register in order to ensure that there is enough physical distancing uh, here in the chapel. We'll require you to pre-register, and it, unfortunately, if you don't pre-register, um, we probably won't have room for you. So make sure before you come, you've pre-registered registered. We also ask you to dress warmly. Uh, the windows and the doors will need to be open in order to enhance the ventilation. We'll also ask you to continue to wear masks um, throughout the service um, while you're in church. And uh, um, unlike before, um, we'll also be requiring people to be fully vaccinated and boosted in order to attend the Eucharist um, on Sundays. Um, as you know, uh, several of the brothers here are classified as vulnerable, um, and this is our home, and we need to do our best, um, especially after the mini-pandemic we had here in the monastery in January, um, we need to do our best to ensure the safety of our brothers. You may have noticed a couple of things that are a little different during the Eucharist today. Um, as you know, it's our practice to draw um, from other resources around the Anglican Communion for portions of our liturgy. And during Lent, we're using some things from the Church of England's Common Worship. That's where the invitation to confession at the beginning of the service comes from. Uh, we have also uh, been using um, as you know, um, enriching our worship, that's where the confession comes from. And uh, again, during Lent, we are using the prayer after communion um, from the Canadian Book of Alternative Services. Um, so as we're just continuing our practice of, of drawing widely um, on liturgical resources around the Anglican communion. Finally, I want to say uh, something about Ukraine. Um, as you um, no doubt have been watching the news, the, the news coming out of Ukraine is both heart-wrenching and astonishing. Um, and we brothers have, um, have both been um, broken-hearted by what's going on in Ukraine, and we have been absolutely astounded by the courage and bravery of the Ukrainian people. Um, and though um, in many ways we feel helpless about what to do, um, we brothers have taken some action um, and we're doing, uh, we're doing a number of things. First of all, we are, of course, praying uh, for the people of Ukraine and for the people of Russia, for their leaders, um, and particularly now for the over one million people who are refugees um, um, because of that war going on. Um, we have also made the decision to divest. Um, earlier this week, I asked uh, our investment manager if we had any investments in Ukraine, and it turned out that we had about $40,000 worth of investments in, U I mean, in Russia. Um, and so we have um, asked our investment manager to divest that. Granted, $40,000 is not very much money in the scheme of things, but the act is, of course, symbolic. We are also giving. Um, earlier this week, we made a donation to the Ukrainian Red Cross, um, and we anticipate being able to do that again uh, in the months ahead. Um, 
we're also taking some action. Um, some brothers have participated in uh, online prayer vigils. Um, a couple of brothers participated in the one that the presiding bishop gathered uh, a week or so ago. And today, two brothers will be attending a gathering at Park Street Church that is being sponsored by the Massachusetts Peace Fellowship. And we're also singing, um, which is um, an incredibly moving thing for us to be doing. Um, earlier, we, uh, we um, Brother Sean put together um, a mass setting drawing from both Kievan, um, Ukrainian, and Russian chants. Um, and so we now have a mass setting that we'll be using on Tuesdays um, that has a Trisagion, a Sanctus, a Lord's Prayer, and a communion verse um, that draws from the resources of both the Ukrainian um, and the uh, Russian musical traditions. Um, and as we have practiced that uh, on Saturdays during choir practice, um, it has been something that we've all commented on um, and how that act of singing um, has um, brought many of us to tears. Um, so I just wanted you to know um, what we are doing uh, about uh, the, situ the war in Ukraine. Now, wherever you are and whatever you are up to today, please know that we are upholding you in our prayers. Thanks for being with us.